At the beginning of this month, Joe Biden became the first president to visit Tulsa, Oklahoma on the anniversary of the race massacre that happened there 100 years ago. That's when a white lynch mob killed as many as 300 black residents and destroyed Greenwood, a thriving neighborhood known as Black Wall Street. It was one of the worst incidents of racial violence in American history, but you won't find a word about it in most history books. And it's just one of the many such attacks that have long been ignored in this country. For more than a decade, the Department of Justice has been re-examining cases of racist killings through the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act, championed by the late civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis. Mr. Speaker, the time has come there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of these crimes that were never brought to justice. There are murders who have walked free for decades while the families of victims cried for justice. Now, a new multi-platform investigative report is telling those stories. It's called Unresolved, and it's a collaboration between Frontline and Northeastern Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. And I'm joined now by the architect, and we'll explain why she's an architect of it all, and director, the new media artist, Tamara Shogaloo. Welcome so much, Tamara. So great to meet you. Congratulations on this project. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I want, I want to talk first about the, the horrific stories that um, we're examining here. Talk a little bit about um, why these deaths didn't get investigated. And I know some people might be thinking these are deaths from like 100 years ago, but some of them are uh, within our, well within our lifetimes. Talk about that for me. Um, well, I mean, if you, that's part of what the investigation was about, looking into the different reasons in which, why some of these cases weren't, um, solved. And there's a variety of reasons where sometimes, um, they found that, um, there were some cases in which the police collaborated with, with people who are accused, um, of these crimes and let them go, or, uh, or there was a lack of evidence, they would say, or sometimes, uh, the, the, the people who the perpetrators or accused perpetrators died. Um, so there's a whole variety of reasons, and there's 151 cases on this list uh, that were that were reopened um, to be investigated. And part of the goal of this investigation was to find out what happened in particular with these cases. And the lens of it is is through that of, of Emma Till, which I'm sure most of our, our viewers are aware of the horrendous story of, of Emma Till's death and how his murderers um, were not convicted, but also through the, the Emma Till Act um, that tries to, to bring justice uh, and investigations to these these murders. But you start the podcast series with with the story of Emmett Till, right? Yeah, I I designed. I was the creative director on the project, so I designed um, the visuals and the web interactive and installation in particular, as well as sort of the art direction for the overall series. And the the podcast team um, was led uh, by a, a different team of of reporters um, that goes through how they were personally impacted by Emmett Till. Um, and then further into investigating and looking into different cases in particular. Talk to me about how this is set up because it's it's a it's an experience. And you know, I was saying that you're an architect is kind of underselling it. Of of all the parts that you've put together, uh, the multi platform, the web interactive, the augmented reality. Um, there's the podcast. There'll be a national tour. Talk to me about how you design this experience. Yeah, um, it's a yeah, it's a multi-platform experience. It it composes it's composed of a podcast, a web interactive, uh, two installations, um, and a film that will be completed in the fall. Uh, the the installation one of the installations is currently exhibiting in, in New York as part of the Tribeca Film Festival in Battery Park, um, and the idea behind it is that it's a living quilt that audiences are able to explore with their phone through augmented reality. And you're invited to say the name of the individual to then find out more about their case, um, what was done, what the Department of Justice or the FBI did to look into these. And in addition to that, you get to hear from the next of kin of surviving next of kin of these individuals on the list. Um, and in a way, it's a celebration of the lives of these lives that were so tragically lost. Yeah, I was uh, I, I was struck very much about the, it's not a passive experience. You're, you're invited and 
again encouraged and compelled to say the name of the victims and to not again just focus on their deaths but also their lives. Yeah, definitely. And for those who can't make it to the installation, um, you're able to explore from home and you're able to look at, at different types of cases. So there's cases where um, the accused uh, uh, person or accused murder, murderer is still alive, or in some other cases that have been closed, some that were deemed a success, and a case that is still open. Um, and kind of using those as case, study, case studies to see what happened. So we invite people at home to also be able to partake in it. Um, and in addition to the installation currently in New York, there's another one that is now at the Rosa Parks Museum um, in Alabama where people will be able to, to visit and explore. Uh, I know that most folks may know this and some may not, but can you talk a little bit about augmented reality and um, what it is? It's, it's when you're using your phone and it, it does what? Um, so in this case, your phone is kind of like a viewfinder or a tool to see things that maybe the eye, the naked eye can't see. So in this case, um, the augmented reality connects you to a narrator uh, that then guides you through this living quilt. Um, you'll see a list of different names um, that are etched onto the quilts themselves. And then you say the name of the person you enter a sort of case card that gives you more information about their case, allows you to hear their next of kin. And within this quilt, it also allows you to find out more information. So you learn more about why the Till Act was set up. You learn more about the design itself and the symbolism that is hidden within this quilt. And in addition to that, you also get to learn about some specific figures on the list as well. So as, as you're designing this, I mean, you've got, you've got a number of things that you have to balance. You've got the history, the historic, nature of it, which is, is tragic. You've also got the stories of the victims that you want to tell and do so with respect and reverence. And you want to educate, yet you have to make it engaging where you're storytelling and people want to hear more. And then you've got this, this wild ability to take access to use all of these great new tools um, that we didn't have as recently as 10 years ago. How did you wrap your mind all around this? Well, I mean, I think in part it's this was a huge team effort and I was fortunate enough to get to collaborate with some really amazing journalists at Frontline who had spent more than two years investigating these stories and cases before I was invited in to design it um, and craft a way for people to explore all of this. Um, so taking from there, I think it allowed us a really great opportunity to, to allow art and technology and journalism to kind of come together to create a new way for people to access material and, and ultimately, I think, bring the past to the present. Um, because people often think that civil rights cases are something of the past. But I think as you start exploring these different parts of the series, you start realizing how much alive these stories still are today. I, I know I didn't learn about Emmett Till until I was an adult. Um, and I went to college and was fully involved in a number of areas. Um, it, is, it, is it a burden, a challenge, an honor to be able to um, to, to bring these stories to people who may not have been taught? And are you hoping, I know there's going to be an educational aspect of this that goes on the road, are, are you hoping that this becomes part of the regular curriculum for, for all schools? Yeah, I mean, I think that it would be really great if it became part of school and, and allowed um, students a different way to access this type of information. Um, and I think, uh, I hope that ultimately it, it also serves as a memorial in a way for these individuals. Some of the next of kin and, um, came to visit the, the installation and got to experience it. And I realized that in many cases for them, justice isn't just getting somebody um, to pay for the crime, but it's a sort of acknowledgement that their, their next of kin or their relative that they lost lived or that something happened to them. Um, and I hope that this can help contribute to some sort of uh, healing in that way uh, of getting acknowledgement that they they lived. Indeed. Um, what are you looking at next? What are some technologies or um, tools, toys that we don't know about yet that you're looking at as ways to tell stories? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely see technology, new technology as tools and, and, and toys that support the storytelling. I'm working on a story now that is driven by Black Girl Magic and allows uh, users to enter a space and interact with voice and movement to help move the story forward. 
Um, and at my studio, we generate new ways of, of utilizing technology to support the story um, and usually let the story drive the shape and form of the work. Um, so I'm excited to dive into that next. We, we've gone a long time without um, centering the voices of the people who the stories are about. Um, and I, I feel we, we may be on a tipping point in our uh, needed reckoning to, to finally do that. Are, are you seeing more people of all communities being able to tell the stories of their communities? Is it, is it a time for hope when it comes to uh, centering those voices? Yeah, I'm definitely seeing a growth in that. Um, and there's, and particularly in the field of new and immersive media, I think there's more um, people from marginalized communities that are leading storytelling, uh, but I think there's still room for growth um, in terms of who gets the opportunities or who invests on um, gets the investment um, because technology is very expensive. And, and unfortunately the investment isn't evenly spread out yet, but I hope that that continues to change. What, what do you want the message of Unresolved to be when folks see it and experience it? Um, I hope that people leave with a sense of agency, uh, that they're able to, um, to partake or, or make a change. All of these individuals are people who tried to make a change. A significant number of these individuals died for voting or for registering to vote. Um, and I think as we see that voting rights in the country are being restricted, I fear that this is something that could come again. Um, and really kind of, I hope that people are able to reflect on the cycles uh, of how history keeps repeating itself and maybe we can stop it from repeating itself once more. Was there anything that you learned that you didn't know while you were working on it? Yeah, um, there's one case in particular um, or a few of them that really marked me, but I was, there's a individual by the name of Jimmy Lee Jackson, um, who's one of the cases that's deemed a, a success um, in, in the Till Act, um, but his death led to the Selma, the Selma protest, um, which I had no idea. And I remember when I was reading through it, how similar it was to what was happening last summer with the George Floyd protest. And, and there's just these echoes of the present and the past. And I think we really need to start kind of recalling these names from the past and see how they're being presented today to, to see what we can do to change things. Well, Tom Roshogaloo, it's a great pleasure to meet you. I wish you the best of luck. I can't wait to experience uh, the full unresolved. Good luck to you. And I, I hope we talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye.